Thank you, Vishal, for organizing. Uh, Boston is a great hub for big data. Uh, so uh, I was going to ask uh, the panel here introduce themselves very briefly. So let me start by very briefly introducing what I do. So besides Gregory, my second name is probably KD Nuggets. So now that's my main activity. I publish uh, Twitter, which you can follow me, and also a newsletter and a website. And last month actually was the best month. I think KD Nuggets got uh, about 100,000 unique visitors. But I started KD Nuggets as a way to connect um, about 50 researchers that attended the first conference I organized, first actually workshop organized on knowledge discovery and data mining about 20 years ago. And in the process, I moved from being a researcher at GT Labs to a chief scientist at a couple of startups, data mining consultant, now mostly like a kind of editor or analyst, and it gives me uh, pleasure of being able to ask uh, smart people and also get free passes as media to different conferences. <laughs> so if you have interesting questions or topics uh, you want to discuss uh, with me or with, you know, 100,000 other people, uh, send me a tweet to Katie Nuggets or email. So that's my brief intro and uh, uh, my pleasure to... So let me just ask uh, in this order. So I guess first uh, David Jagan. Hi, so is this on? I think it's on now. Um, so my name is David Jagan. I work with Devonshire Investors, which is a private investment arm of the owners of Fidelity Investments. So we don't invest in half of Fidelity per se, but of, of the family that owns Fidelity. And we have a multi-billion dollar venture capital fund with investment teams in uh, Boston, London, Shanghai, Mumbai. And I am with a $100 million early stage fund here in Boston. We focus on enterprise IT and FinTech. So some of our investments in this area have included good data, some may, many of you may know in the cloud BI space, Neo4j in the graph database space. We uh, had investment in Cloudant uh, until recently acquired by IBM. And just by way of background, I about sorry, 20 years ago or so, I started a company of my own. I was a co-founder of Sensoria, which was an explosive detection company, a sniffing device company. And then was an early employee of Into Networks, which was backed by uh, Benrock, a venture capital firm, and Fidelity Ventures, uh, which was eventually my introduction back to the Devonshire investment arm. Um, and then I worked with, with Cisco Systems and ran Cisco's outsourcing uh, division for about five years, which was all of the Cisco technology sold through outsourcers like IBM and HP, and then have been investing with Devonshire for the last five years. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Anand Ra. Uh, I'm a partner in uh, PwC within our analytics practice, and I lead the innovation group within analytics uh, for the, the US group. And what we do is uh, essentially we do uh, analytics, big data analytics, as well as the regular analytics, if you like, uh, across all different sectors, uh, financial services, uh, healthcare, telecommunications, retail, CPG, all across. Uh, so we use a range of techniques uh, more traditional statistical techniques, uh, more big data analytic type of techniques, primarily simulation modeling, uh, system dynamics modeling, agent-based modeling, uh, and discrete event modeling, as well as some of the newer big data in terms of natural language processing, social networking, analysis, machine learning. So the group does the entire spectrum of different types of analytics. We tend to categorize them as statistical uh, analytics and computational analytics, and both worlds are coming together there's no strict divide between statistical and non-statistical computational techniques. Uh, just as a background, uh, my background is in artificial intelligence. Before everything was called big data, I used to work in big data. So I did my PhD in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, primarily focused around uh, agent-based modeling and simulation. Uh, in those days, it was primarily the aerospace and defense. I worked quite a lot with NASA, and I was in Australia, so I worked with the Australian defense. Uh, across uh, a variety of different analytic applications. Worked a lot in uh, natural language processing and machine learning, semantic networks, and so on. Uh, that was for around 10, 12 years. Then I essentially shifted focus and moved more into management consulting, working with a wide range of financial services and telecommunication companies. Uh, almost half a dozen years back, so six, seven years back, the two worlds started coming together. I know there's a very uh, cool name for it, data scientist, 
but it's essentially the combination of all the analytics and all of the business domain knowledge that I accrued with the financial services and telecommunications came together. So started the simulation group within the broader analytics, and that's been very great. That's a tough act to follow. Uh, so uh, Chip Hazard, I'm a general partner and founder of Flybridge Capital Partners. We're a seed in Series A, very early stage software investment firm uh, here in Boston, also with offices in New York. Um, we focus up and down the software stack. Uh, I've been in the venture business for 20 years. Uh, prior to Flybridge, I was at a firm called Greylock. I remember distinctly when one company came in and said, you won't believe it, we built a data warehouse that has a terabyte of data. So I've been doing this long enough back when a terabyte of data was considered to be a lot. Um, in the big data space, uh, we invest both at the infrastructure layer, uh, in tools and technologies, companies like MongoDB as an example, uh, the database world. Uh, and then we also have an investment practice in the application of uh, big data and machine learning and advanced analytic techniques to help solve real business problems. So we have uh, a company in online advertising called DataZoo. We have one in uh, healthcare analytics called Predalytics, one in security analytics called BitSight, one in consumer finance called Zest Finance. So you get the picture. So we, we spend time at both the application layer and at the infrastructure layer. Hi. Um, really tough acts to follow. <coughs> I'm, I'm Paul Markowitz. I am part of the Advanced Analytics Group at Bain & Company. And uh, in our group, what we do is we do a lot of things that take client data or survey data or other types of data and provide meaning to them to answer client business problems. I've been at Bain for a year and a half about, uh, but been in the management consulting business for over a decade. Started at Mercer Management Consulting and then at a few related companies to that. And I actually come from a completely different world, which is the small data side, which I come from the survey research world. So I spent a lot of time taking survey research and trying to use experiments in surveys and use uh, other things in surveys to understand who people are, what makes them think, and what makes them uh, buy the products that they buy, and what makes them satisfied and dissatisfied, and things like that. And so what, what's different for me is taking the ideas that we've learned from the small data world and applying them to larger problems, larger types of different types of data, and different types of business problems. Thank you, Paul. So I have uh, three questions, and then I promise that uh, all of you will have a chance to uh, ask your own questions. So uh, big data is both an irritating buzzword and also a real phenomenon. So one example of limits of big data is Netflix price. A few years ago, Netflix paid a million dollars for the best algorithm to improve predictions and after three years and you know tens of thousands of smartest people they managed to reduce error from 0.95 stars to 0.86 stars so still almost a star off on the other hand you know google and facebook's are could be considered amazing examples of big data let's call it new big data so with that intro let me start with paul so what uh, what uh, do you think about big data? Has it reached its high peak yet? And what would be the next quote unquote big thing in big data? Uh, great question. I, I don't think it's reached the peak yet. I, mean, I think you know, we learned from Paul's, from Paul's presentation that it's kind of just starting, right? And that there's, there's a lot more out there. I think we have the ability now to collect lots and lots of data we don't have the ability really to make a lot of good sense of it. And so what happens is, and we, we don't have a good ability to tell what's the good data from what's the bad data, or what's signal from what's noise. And so there's a lot of work out there that goes to understanding, understanding observed phenomenon in these data and then trying to make sense, rational sense of it after the fact when in fact sometimes what you're making rational sense out of doesn't have any rational sense to make. And I think that the next thing is to try to, to separate those things out and get better at maybe having systems where you actually can be model driven and you actually can have some theory or some, some structure that you can put on this unstructured stuff that, that helps you tease out the signal of the noise. Thank you. Could you say, I think you will in to ask a question, answer this question, what is the next big thing in big data. Is that for me? Uh, yeah, I, I was going to ask the same question. Oh, okay. Um, so, so as I alluded to earlier, we're, as early stage investors, we're focused less on what's important today and where are dollars flowing today and more on where they're going to be flowing 
over the course of the next you know three to ten years and from from our perspective we have shifted our focus which would have been three four years ago again more at infrastructure and tools and you, know, you look at a lot of companies that have come out of the venture capital ecosystem not just MongoDB which I mentioned but you know Cloudera and all the various uh, Hadoop variations and you know new companies that are that are coming at the infrastructure layer we think the next generation of companies is going to be focused on taking those tools and techniques and approaches and trying to use them to solve uh, discrete business problems where the ability to do real-time analytics, the ability to provide insights to business leaders in a way that they can act on and change their practice of their business. So, so being effective with big data is not just having the tools and techniques, it's having the organization and the people and the insights that you can actually act on. And so more application layer uh, opportunities is where we see 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 the the puck going, if you will. And you can just think of any vertical where they're churning out reams and reams of data, and how do you use that to make better decisions and provide the the not just the, the data layer but the analytic layer with where the you know mere mortals can make sense of those uh, insights and act upon them from a business perspective. So what 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 in, in your opinion is the next big thing? So it's just interesting if you <clears throat> sorry. If you look at the word big data and how it's been used for the past few years since it's been in, in currency, the word itself has been morphing and getting a bigger and bigger view of what it really means. So obviously we discussed the big data, the three Vs or the four Vs, uh, if you add veracity to the, the three Vs. So that's sort of the more standard way in which the big data got defined. And then it got associated with all of the technologies that that provides the whole Apache, Hadoop, and the NoSQL databases. So those are the two that most often come to mind when people talk about big data. So that's, again, taking its course. But where we see the next range of things happening is very much around the decisions that people are making. So to, to, to us, in a sense, again, being a consulting company, consulting to C-level executives, uh, it's much more about what decisions are you making. Forget about whether it's a big data or a small data. Look at what decisions you are making and how can we make those decisions better, more effective, more efficient. So it's all about the decisions and the big decisions and what analytics and insights can support you in making those decisions. So that's how we get to the data, both the small and the big data, to support the insights that the analytics would generate. So to me, the next two big things would be the decisions and the analytics that would support the generation of those insights. The last one, I think which will take some more time, maybe three, five years out, is the fundamental change in the mindset. And if you look at, it's staggering, if you look at uh, large corporations and the way they view even big data versus the startup organization, mm -hmm. it is a totally different world. They're still wanting, I need to cleanse all the data. This data quality is not good, right? So how do I start building the model without full data? Whereas the big data, if you go into the smaller companies, it's an entirely different mindset. The data informs the model, the model informs the data, as opposed to uh, having everything in one place before you start doing anything. That's still the corporate mindset that we see. And that will change over time. So, uh, Dave, so what is the next big thing in big data? Well, <clears throat> I mean, maybe just answer, you know, on the hype side of things, I just distinguish hype from the next big thing. I, you know, I would say, my meter for the hype is when my mother walks through an airport and sees a, a SAP ad for big data. And I think, you know, in that sense, there is definitely a hype. You know, we've reached that point. But I, that is very separate from, you know, how the implications of that, you know, ripple through to, you know, enterprises and to businesses. And there I just see, you know, a long way to go. I, I feel like we've been in a phase where it's been a deployment of infrastructure. And so there's a lot of database variants, a lot of tools that have been deployed. Um, we're in a phase of investing in analytics and the tools to make, make uh, to leverage that. But you know, you think of the average business analyst and the kind of decisions they're using. You know, Tableau and ClickView as kind of very business friendly uh, tools. You know, are still very low penetration. You know, below a twenty percent penetration in your average you know enterprise, and yet they are tools that could be used by a very wide base. So I think a lot of the big data and the data analytics implications are really <coughs> are very early stages of being rolled out. Um, it's hard to say what the next, you know, really big thing is. I, I think, you know, we're, we will experience a phase of kind of a consolidation around the database variants over some period of time. Um, I think we'll see a changing role of, of the data scientist and the business analyst and the machine. 
and how those you know integrate in the roles that they play, um, and I think a lot of those just have, have yet to play out. Well, thank you. That's a good lead into my next question about data scientists, whether they will be replaced by automated algorithms. Uh, I think uh, almost uh, everyone in this room has seen the projection by McKinsey that would be 140 to 190,000 uh, data scientists shortage just in the U.S. by 2018. I don't know exactly where they got those numbers, but uh, many companies are now uh, thinking that they cannot hire enough data scientists and instead they want more uh, easy to use algorithms, what's called democratization of algorithms. There's companies that come up with much simpler to use uh, systems they call data scientists in a box. So I guess my question with this in mind, um, not whether data scientists will be in the box, but more, more seriously the question is, can this be really automated? Uh, will data scientists be replaced by automated algorithms? So let me start with, with you, David. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I suppose maybe you start with an analogy. I could, you know, in some ways when you ask, I mean, am I, I guess I'm a human, right? So in terms of asking, will I be replaced by a machine? It's like asking a pilot, you know, from 20 years ago. You know, if, do you think you'll be replaced by the autopilot? And, you know, they definitely would say no. Um, but at the same time, you know, their role changed significantly, right? And so the pilot flies 20% of the time instead of 100% of the time. And in extreme examples, like in the drone case, right, they're not even in the aircraft, right? Their role has fundamentally changed. So I, I think in that sense, you know, of course the machine won't displace the human. Um, they'll have, they'll find some, you know, coexistence, some optimal role, and humans do what they do really well. Um, you know, humans, machines do, kind of speed at scale really well. They apply rules really well and can be trained. Um, <clears throat> the data scientist or the human involved, you know, will probably play a very important role in pattern recognition, identification of a new pattern, or uh, training the algorithm so it can operate in the first place, or in, again, the case of Tableau or ClipView, being more of a ad hoc queries, where you don't know what you're asking, or you don't know until maybe the CEO asks, you know, a question on Monday morning, which is, you know, <clears throat> which why does this warehouse do better than all the rest? Right? Those questions are hard, hard to automate because uh, they're very ad hoc. Um, you know, PayPal is a good example. Just by, you know, PayPal had a fraud problem early on, and I think applied primarily machines to that problem and realized that it, you know, the machines could do a very good job of, of applying rules, but then the fraudsters would change the way they did things. Um, but it now is more of a coexistence where they flag the exceptions. They flag the things that might have a probability of fraud, and a human being gets involved in, in looking at that. Um, we have an investment in Kensho Finance, which is a quantitative finance platform, and I think it's a good example as well. They've married lots of market data and event data, which help an analyst very quickly say, you know, if X event happens, if unemployment is 1% or 10 basis points higher than expected, like over the course of time, how did the markets react to that surprise? And that can tell the analyst a lot. It says, you know, this is a likelihood of what has happened, but you'll still have a portfolio manager who's involved in interpreting that and applying context and deciding whether they really want to trade on that. Um, I'm going to just make a, one second point, I think, is around, like it'll be interesting to watch how, uh, like maybe the timing of the machine versus the human and, and how they actually interact and, and, and the, Maybe there's art in some of this. It's like, where do you bring the human in to a, a machine-led process? And you know, there are companies like Data Tamer, which is a, a, one of the recent companies from Michael Stonebreaker, where you know it's very much about using the machine to curate data that's going into the ETL queue and trying to automate that process. But it will never be 100% accurate. But where do they bring that human in, and at what point, and how artfully do they they ask the expert in? Uh, you know, in, in physics or in HR data or customer record data to get involved, you know, rate that, curate that data manually, train the machine, and have the machine keep going. So I think there'll be some really interesting uh, art in how that is accomplished uh, within the workforce and, and uh, you know, done well. So. What we're thinking. So, Hernan? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. So will a data scientist be replaced by an algorithm? Wearing my AI hat, artificial intelligence hat, I know how hard it is uh, to actually mimic 
the reasoning that human beings go through. Right? So in that sense, I would say no. And there probably would be some tasks that would get automated. Um, and we are seeing more of that. So the democratization of analytics will happen. Uh, and, you know, has anyone used a software called Eureka, spelled E-U-R-E-Q-A? Yeah. So uh, if you haven't, just go and check it out. That's essentially doing uh, what a typical statistician would do in terms of regression analysis. So you go there and you just tell, give a few criteria. It crunches through every possible combination of different types of symbols as well as equations to come up with the best fit. And you can say, I want a best fit, which is linear, which is quadratic, which is of three variables, five variables, whatever it is. You give the criteria, and it crunches through uh, multiple CPU cycles to come up with that. So now you might ask, so what's the need for someone who understands statistics and how that regression needs to be done? The system is doing it for you. Again, I'm not saying that the statistician is not needed. Now the statisticians are putting their effort into something more and better. So in that sense, I would see the more and more of those tasks, as you were saying, uh, would be automated uh, and there'll be systems. But at the other end, uh, would it completely eliminate the notion of a human being? Um, I think not, but again, a caveat there is very much the time frame. In the next 10, 15, 20 years, the answer is no. Although I'm an AI scientist, I'm also a Kurzweilian and I'm also a singularity believer. So maybe it's not 2040 like Ray Kurzweil says, maybe it's a few decades after that, but I think eventually it's the, the combination of uh, human aided with machines and machine aided with human uh, intelligence would probably what will play out. That's a long way off. So should we talk about singularity for a while? <laughs> we, we, could, we could go down this path for a long time. But uh, my, my two cents is, is, is probably somewhat similar. I think the flaw in the McKenzie analysis is that they they take sort of the current work approach and they extrapolate that forward and and therefore come up with this huge shortage, but don't take into account that there's gonna be significant efficiency. If you think about as a data scientist, where do you spend your time today setting up systems, cleaning data, organizing data, getting it all work, work together, all that will be taken care of for you. But what's, what's left is, are you asking the right questions? And that sort of intellectual curiosity that drives good analysis and so, as a data scientist, you'll, you know, to be successful as we go forward, the key role will be asking the right questions, being intellectually curious, pushing the data around, asking the wrong question, learning from that. And that iterative process is very hard to automate and will be what drives the insights on top of hopefully a, a data layer that will get increasingly more simple, uh, less complex, and easier to manage. Well, I, I think Chip just stole exactly my thunder, which is that, you know, the the, the investments that these guys are making is going to make a lot of things better. It's going to probably make it make the need for um, data scientists increase, right? Because somebody's got to understand how all these things work. Somebody's got to implement them all. Somebody's got to get the stuff in, you know, get the data in and get the data out. And it's not going to do it by itself. And so I, I do think that there will be more data scientists doing more interesting things and as a data scientist, you're going to do less drudge work and more interesting things, just, just as Chip said, because all of the infrastructure <coughs> tools are going to come around and make all the drudgery, not all the drudgery, make a lot of the drudgery go away. So all the time that you spend getting, organizing, cleaning, and everything else data will will get better. I think, uh, although I think there is some uh, two different tendencies. One is, you know, automating more of the... Uh, infrastructure, all of the data cleaning, so that actually reduces the need for maybe lower and mid-level data science. There will always be a need for good anything, you know, any profession could be good data scientists, but I, I don't think there would be a huge increase in number of data scientists because there would be a lot more verticals. You know, one interesting recent example is Kaggle, this data competition platforms have changed their business model and now they're looking for, to build vertical solutions starting with oil and gas industry, rather than trying to do generic solutions. Um, so, um, another interesting question is about privacy. So, big data and privacy really are opposite in a sense. When everything is digitized, people leave so much digital exhaust and it's, it's very hard to be anonymous. Uh, 
A few years ago, AOL released some search queries that they thought were anonymized, and somebody very quickly found uh, that they could de-identify a couple of people with some sensitive information. Uh, the second Netflix prize, again, was canceled because some smart researchers were able, again, to de-identify, again, only a few uh, of the people, but enough to present the legal risk. And just, uh, I think, this week, Facebook announced that their algorithms can now do face recognition with 97% accuracy, which is essentially the same as humans can. So I guess the question is, what will happen with big data and privacy? Will people get used to having less privacy, or will there be some technological or society solutions that will enable better marketing or better targeting with big data while preserving some privacy? So, David, I guess the question is big data versus privacy. So, uh, you know, I suppose on, on one level, people have spoken for a long time that, you yeah, know, they're willing to give up uh, a fair amount of privacy, so I'm not so sure. In a way, it's probably a false choice, but, you know, uh, people don't encrypt their email, people uh, use credit cards, people surf the web, et cetera. Facebook is, you know, a shining example. So I think there's, the difference is, you know, the unprecedented opportunity to destroy anonymity, as you say, and, you know, and prevent reuse of your, of your data. Um, and I do think, you know, it's interesting to see what the European Union, you know, is doing on this. I think they're raising the profile and the perspective on that, but, um, you know, their approaches are going to be very difficult to enforce, right? It's, it's a, uh, uh, by having an opt-in model on, on cookies, as an example, it merely leads to a 99% opt-in, and you're back to the same problem. Um, I think that, you know, the hardest thing about privacy is just the difficulty of enforcing it, and, um, you know, this may be a bad analogy, but like, you know, America is about case law where, you know, uh, it took 30 years and many cases to decide what search and seizure was, to decide, like, how far can the police go in search and seizure. And I think there's something about privacy as well. Like, you know, people will only figure that out as we go and when things get creepy or when, um, you know, something happens that society believes is, you know, crosses a certain boundary. And then, you know, privacy will, will become an issue. Um, and perhaps a you know final piece on this, like security and privacy, in my, my mind, are two sides of the same coin. And security is about trusting someone, and you know trusting someone to, and how they will use your data or that they will not reuse it. And privacy is trusting no one, um, and saying I want to be you know have the domain over my data and decide how to use that. And I think we'll see a lot more investment in security, a lot more progress in security, in the granular uh, level of security, in the in the real time kind of monitoring. And Clients of how data is used, and probably a lot less progress overtly, you know, in protecting people's privacy. Interesting perspective. So, uh, I would say there are two parallel things will will happen as as we go into this. Uh, one is, as you said, the privacy and very uh, privacy and security are closely linked, but also the notion of who ownership, who owns the data. Is it I who own the data, or a device manufacturer who produced that data, uh, who made the device, who is owning that data? I think that's where it will come to the crunch, and we will see laws being passed, whether it's an EU type of law or maybe some variant of it, where I think as individuals, we'll own the data and can make it available to others on whatever terms that individuals want to provide that or not provided at all. I think that will evolve. It'll probably it'll be at least a few years away. Regulation always plays catch up with the companies and the case law and everything that happens before, then the regulators will come in. So I think that trend is, is it will happen as it relates to privacy and protection of privacy. Another parallel thing that we also see happening is just the changing behavior of people, the demographics, the social behavior changes and again it's very clear as to at least our generation what we valued and what we treated as private there's some generations which say oh, that's fine I'm not doing anything I'm just going to post it on Facebook so there's more of that openness will come in right or wrong not passing a moral judgment here but I think there's going to be more 
being comfortable with the technology, being comfortable with sharing, and therefore sharing more than the previous generations is already happening and will continue to happen. Even among the older generation, I remember in the 2000s, early 2000s, people said, oh, you'll never put a credit card on an online system. Never do that, right? But now, even almost every realm of the society is using online purchasing and putting in their credit card, right? So why does it happen? It's sort of just the familiarity uh, essentially removes some of that uh, a scariness and the trust comes in to some provider in between. Yeah, so on this particular topic, I just uh, was down at the South by Southwest conference uh, talking about enterprise and big data, shockingly. Um, but, I, but the big theme of the conference was security and privacy. And so you'd think in that audience everyone would care. And I talked to every consumer I could lay my hands on. Do you care about data privacy? Do you care about data privacy? And it's just not a consumer hot button. And, and you know, that's a crowd that skews younger. Um, but, if it, but it's 100% a trade of, I will give you every data if you give me something back in return. And, and so you'll put things out there because the insights or the value you get back from the service is a good trade. And so that, my experience is that it's not a mainstream issue at a consumer level. Now, you know, one of the points of the, of the conference was that doesn't matter. It should be incumbent upon the people who provide the service to at least have, you know, different levels of granularity, appropriate levels of security. So I think if you're providing a service and you're doing analytics, you have to be incredibly thoughtful about that. But in terms of going to market, you know, how many people here use Tor? You know, it's just, it's just not a mainstream consumer thing. We can be entirely anonymous. We can be 100% private if we want to be, but no one does it. Uh, and so, you know, I think it can, it's a little bit of a red herring. But again, if you're running an application, you have to pay attention to the red herring because it can blow up on you. Yeah, the, the one thing I'd add to that is that, you know, as people who analyze data, we, we can see that there's a lot of it, right? And nobody has that kind of time to go and try to de-anonymize and try to, to look people up and, and do that. So you say, you know, I'm giving up a lot of my data and people can learn a lot about me, but nobody's really interested in learning about you. They're learning about, interested in learning about you and a lot of other people like you, and they're not interested so much in, you know, they're, they're interested in maybe sending something to you, you know, because you meet a bunch of criteria, but I don't think it's the same type of invasion of privacy. And so I don't think people are that concerned about it. Nobody's really, for the most part, nobody's really trying to do it either. So I, I don't, I think it's a bit of a red area. Plus, of course, it's the NSA trying to sneak into your webcam, in which case you should just cover your webcam if, if, you're, if you're worried about something. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Well, well, thank you. I think um, maybe a good time to ask uh, questions from the audience. And do we have a mic in, in the audience? So if you can just uh, stand up and uh, speak very loudly. So anybody wants to ask a distinguished panel? Any analytic sessions? I predict that it will take uh, maybe about a minute, but somebody uh, will have some questions. Please. I have uh, asked this question of the earlier speaker, and I actually have the same question for this panel. A lot of the things that are being discussed are how the corporations that can afford real data scientists, can afford analytics tools, can afford huge databases, are going to profit from uh, data revolution. At the same time, there are consumers who are generating the data and who are seeing you know, some indirect benefits, but are not seeing real results in their home. Where do you see that, that going? Are there going to be, uh, you know, in the sense of democratization, some tools for the home that are going to truly change uh, lives of uh, consumers? So who wants to this question? I guess the question is whether there are some tools for consumers, maybe related questions whether consumers should get paid for their data. Um, I mean, at the, you know, at the basic level, the indirect effect is huge, right? So all the things that, that companies do, right, the, the fact that, you know, you, you bought the, the iPad and you thought, oh, this iPad's pretty good, but and an iPad that's a little bit different from this, that had this, this, and this feature would be so much better. There's so many better ways for Apple to figure that out now and make the iPad that you really wanted, right? And that's true with with everything, so things in your home, right? Well, I would like my thermostat to auto, you know, automatically turn on, okay? So we have automatic thermostats now, but really what I wanna do is I want my thermostat to recognize that I'm about to wake up, and 10 minutes before I actually wake up, see that my body is changing, you know, my, my brain waves are changing, so I'm about to wake up, I better start heating up the house for me, right? And that would be a really cool thing, right? 
having the data, some company has to go and do this and build the thing for you. So as a consumer, we benefit from all the things that companies do to give us what we as consumers want. So it's, you know, the, the company gets all the data and crunches it and analyzes it and it makes them make better and beneficial, which are then beneficial to us. Yeah, I mean, I would argue that I think big data has had a huge impact on the consumer side. You think about all your consumer web services that leverage big data, you know, LinkedIn suggesting who you should be friends with because it's going to help you business-wise. I gave them data. They gave me a, an interesting contact. That's a pretty interesting consumer value exchange. So you see that. You see Nest, and, you know, and their, Nest just opened up their entire platform with an API, coincidentally run by one of my companies. But, you know, you'll be able to access that, and interesting consumer applications can be built. And so, so I, I think there's clearly going to be a trickle down into consumer applications and consumer use cases, probably less so on the consumer tools, although again, you know, I work, you know, connected device, quantified self, all these kind of things, you're, you know, is that a big data application? You'd probably call it a small data application, but, but you'll, you know, you're starting to see these kind of things in energy efficiency and, and measuring everything that you can get your hands on. So, so I think that wave's uh, already sort of a little bit uh, underway. I would tend to agree with the, the, the other two panelists. So you are seeing quite a lot in terms of, it may not be in your home, but it's in your iPad and everyone is using Amazon. And the, the, the way in which Amazon is recommending, uh, same thing with Netflix. So everything has some level of analytics embedded within it. And then take Nest, and if you look at the, the whole wearable revolution, the whole sensor revolution that's about to come in, it's all going to make that even more so uh, than, than what it is. So it's definitely you're seeing it happen, I would say. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Please. Um, so I was a student recently, and I am currently interested in data science, so that's where this question is coming from. Uh, as someone who's a student recently in college, there aren't many schools right now that have uh, something resembling a data science major. There's certainly computer science majors, there's math majors, and all sorts of majors from other places going into data science. Um, but do you think that that's something that's going to change? Or do you think that the current model of having data scientists come from other disciplines actually works in, in, favor, in favor of data science? Or if you could project a couple years or a decade into the future, what would you see being the future of data science education? So I guess the question about data science education, uh, let me just briefly say that uh, there are now, I think, over 30 schools that offer some version of data science. I actually have a quite comprehensive list on Katie Nuggets under education list of different schools that offer degrees in data science. And, and I did recently a post and the number of such schools is going uh, like a hockey stick. So definitely there is more and more schools offering directly data science degrees. So that any of you want to add? Yeah, I'll probably start here, but I have the mic here. Uh, I would agree that in terms of uh, traditional course work, there are a number of universities that are coming up with a data science course. And if you go to Coursera, there are quite a few of those already, right? When you look at those courses, they, in my view, capture two big elements of what we call as data science. Uh, the statistical analytics part, the computational analytics, or the underlying data, the techniques to use. So in that sense, they do cover a broad breadth of data and analytics needed for doing data science. Where I think <clears throat> they, they are missing out, and it's probably very difficult to teach as opposed to be an apprentice and do, is that domain knowledge. So if you want to be a data scientist in financial services or healthcare, you need to understand healthcare. You need to be in the, in the company doing that, and that's where I think a true data scientist emerges. There's a fourth quality, which is more around the artistic sense, being able to visualize data, being able to present the data, not just in terms of business speak, but something to a lay person or, or a business executive, right? Um, so in that sense, those two artistic sense as well as the business domain is much harder to replicate in a university atmosphere. It either comes naturally or you need to learn it through uh, working in a place. So any other questions? Please. Um, 
Going a little bit further, um, uh, David had a great example of the changing role of the pilot. Uh, that uh, over time, where the pilot is needed has shifted. And um, to your point about subject matter expertise, where do you see the technology trends that are incorporating more subject matter expertise and helping to move the needle of when the human is needed? Sure. Um, so, well, so if the, if the question was kind of where do you see, uh, what are the trends driving the need for subject matter expertise in the data scientist, in um, the data science role? More like handling, um, understanding context, complexity, data definitions, metadata concepts. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I, and, and, and so I suppose in some ways those are only becoming more acute, right? So, so as the, the very nature of the role of the data scientist is that there's going to be a bigger problem in the data wrangling and the data cleansing, the quality, so you have a, in a sense, a problem, greater problem there than you had before. Um, and if you keep moving through to the analytics and then the storytelling around the visualization, right, those are very different skills. And in fact, they don't often come in the, you know, the same person, right? And, and therefore, there are tools that will be brought to bear to make each of us more effective in, in, in those. Um, I think on the, may not answer your question perfectly well, but like on the ingestion side, you know, that's probably where the tools and the machine and, and pre-built models, you know, can be most effective in uh, dealing with that complexity and, and helping people through what are less domain-specific issues and more horizontal, you know, issues that just apply to data and cleaning that up and looking for dedupes, et cetera. And the storytelling, the visualization is probably where that complexity of like, you really need to understand the domain so that when you frame the data and tell the story, you're telling a story that matters to the users of that or to the decision. I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. So one of the things we see because of all the technology that's out there, I think it's almost the, uh, it's, it's making all of the knowledge, body of knowledge, into bite-sized chunks. So the, the YouTubing of the entire knowledge base, right? So rather than having a, a, a full-fledged encyclopedia of all the different things, you're getting bite-sized pieces when they are relevant, where they are relevant. Um, so, uh, for example, if, if, let's say, Google Glasses goes through, and then people wearing the Google Glass can show, demonstrate what they are doing at each and every step or on specific steps they can record it. Then if you have a more intelligent analytic system, it can pull in those examples as needed from a vast collection of recorded data. Just as we are seeing now the whole thing moving into YouTube, so now everyone before you used to have uh, big manuals, thick manuals written and you have to go through step by step. Now for anything you want, you can just go Google uh, it on YouTube and you'll find a few people who have just written uh, or recorded a five minute piece. And you just listen to that piece and you can do what you want. I think more of that will start happening when the domain knowledge is chucked up into smaller pieces. And I think analytics, the data, the devices, all of that will enable more of that to happen more freely. Which is a nice, it's a nice trend. YouTube in of everything. YouTube in of everything. Doesn't, 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 doesn't that YouTube of everything kind of make it, that increases the need for domain expertise because you have to be the person who puts all those clips together to make a big holistic picture. I'm reminded of a, a case I did 10 years ago for a client training where I was training their, their data analytics team and they were, all into using lots of fancy tools, which you know, 10 years ago is fancy tools. But the, the point was that as the analytics team, they were the people who were the closest to the data, right? So what I wanted them to do is really understand what their data was, not understand how to use fancy tools. And the way they can be more effective in their careers and the way they can be more effective for their organization is to understand what's in the data, understand what its strengths are, understand what its limitations are, know what to do next to get the next best, you know, the next data, get the answer out of the thing that they're doing, and even know what question, you know, know what the next 10 questions to ask are. Uh, what do you see the impact of open source on the big data technology market? So the impact of open source on the big data technology market. <clears throat> Well, like, I think it's been a huge enabler, right? If you, if you look at any of the tools and techniques you're using, whether it's Hadoop or R or 
uh, or any of the NoSQL databases, they're all open source at the core. And, and I don't know that they have to be, but that's clearly the way the world's going. And you know, we have companies in our portfolio that are applying uh, big data techniques to solve vertical problems, as I said earlier. And you look at the cumulative spend they've spent on software, it's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, not tens of billions of dollars. And, and that just opens up the world in terms of what you can try to do. And so it's, for me, it's very empowering and it, and it creates a lot of opportunities. So we're, we're obviously excited about it. I mean, with the ramifications of private markets as well, I guess is another aspect of that question. To your point, millions drop to thousands. Yeah, no, I like How does the investment focus over time or development? Well, I think you keep your report. I think there's, I think there's two different, um, I think there's two different answers. So those that are using the technology are benefiting from all these uh, open source frameworks and the commoditization and the cloud and all that. And so we can start companies for millions of dollars, you know, a million or two million dollars that I used to need to put 10 or 20 million dollars in. So, so there's a huge impact on that front. Uh, for the companies that are providing the technologies, um, you just, you need to be really thoughtful about, you, you know, A, are you going to get open sourced out of business if you're pursuing a, a proprietary model? Or how you leverage open source to create, uh, you know, significant advantages. And so I'm on the board of an open source database company. The product's free; anyone can download it. Six and a half million people have downloaded it, uh, and so it's got widespread distribution. And then we have some things that we can sell on top of that that we're going into selling to customers who are already using the product. So, so it allows me to change my cost structure and how I go to market in in pretty fundamental ways. So it's it's just a different business model. But you have to be very thoughtful about how you try to try to commercialize around around open source. Do you have a question? Well, actually, I wanted to talk to the academic question you were given earlier. Regarding the data scientist education? Yeah. Um, so I teach at EMC, uh, EMC uh, data science course. EMC has a program called the Academic Alliance, and we give away our course material to colleges that are interested. We're helping to bootstrap colleges to build up a program to give you a feel for what kind of things are going on. That was my first one. Second point, I'll be really surprised in three to five years do not see something like Olivia's office for actuarials and certified for financial accounts. So there's going to be some sort of industry-wide certification program. And there's going to be some basic qualifications required for data scientists. I, I, I'd be shocked that it isn't happening sometime in the next three to five years. Uh, well, <coughs> actually, uh, in we Forbes... We've up here. Do you want to come? Because you, uh, you, you know a lot of what you're uh, talking about. Uh, uh, in Forbes, I think, pro probably, I think probably most people in the audience know uh, maybe as much as we here, so, but I just wanted to comment that actually INFORMS already has a certification program. Uh, by the way, uh, this is a week for conferences because next week there is INFORMS conference in Boston and there is also Big Data Tech Con conference in Boston at the same time. So hopefully you can attend both or at least one. Uh, so add other questions. Excellent question. The value of data and marginal, I guess, cost marginal return of the, on data. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting question. And, and you know, there are definitely, it's, it's, you know, there's a phrase that almost people throw out, like, you know, the data is being commoditized, right? And, you know, I don't think that's probably the right phrase for it at all. Like, data continues to have extreme, you know, a lot of value in the right context to the right user at the right moment, right? And that both applies in the small data sense of like, I need to know that now, and it applies in the really big sense. It's like Thomson Reuters and Axiom and you know, many other data providers that are able to make, extract still a lot of value from that. Uh, as a, from an investment perspective, I think one of the things we, I look at as changing though is that the traditional data, incumbent data providers like the ones I just mentioned, you know, they are being, there is a really good opportunity to disrupt them because the ability to aggregate that data has changed. There, it is no longer survey based, you know, which had has fundamental flaws when you do it. It's no longer human curated. But people like CB Insights in the venture industry or Factual for geolocation data are using web crawling technologies and you know public sources and pulling that together in a way that 
gets a lot of the same value and often enough value for a much lower cost. And that does two things. I mean, one, they have maybe a comparable blend of data to sell, but it really allows them to free up resources to focus on things that the user will care more about. So marrying that data to analytics becomes super important, and that's one the two things I think we look for that go to go with that, as well as the visualization side of that. And um, there's no small thing for a startup of 10 people to know that they can have only two people dedicated to data curation, when Thomson Reuters and the market data side will have I mean, hundreds of people dedicated to that. And that's a lot of the advantage of machine learning, semantic analysis, and a lot of what we're talking about tonight, changing the data value proposition. Just to add uh, about value of data, I saw a startup recently that was offering people $8 a month for access to the Facebook and other social network data, $8 a month. And there were not that many papers. Uh, so I think uh, probably given the time, I, we can uh, ask the panel one more question. Please. different roles for data scientists and teams, and what is the role that business analysts can do in such teams? So you're right in the sense that data science, we often say that, uh, where is the unicorn? If you can find a unicorn, you can find a data scientist with all the different skill sets that we require of them. Domain expert, uh, statistical wizard, uh, someone who understands technology, data, infrastructure, everything. And by the way, he or, he or she also needs to be a visualization and an artist. So where can you get a single person who can, and a better, good communicator, right? So in that sense, it's, it's very difficult to get that one data scientist who encompasses everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the idea is, so more and more people are talking about the data science team. Right. So if you look at the, the four or five things that we are talking about, at least two or maybe three is something that you can find in any one person. So taking your example, so someone in the business and someone who's playing the business IT liaison, business architecture, business analyst who understands the business, who can also speak the technology language, they would be one. They need to be paired up with someone who is in the analytics side who can understand a little bit about the business domain but can also do the statistical analysis. The technology folks, very similar, right? So you get a combination of two or three of these skills and then I think as an organization, uh, you need to worry about, so if you're staffing these people, you need to f get the right group of people so that you form a data science team and they learn from each other, right? So you'll start learning more about when to apply certain statistical techniques, when does one work, when does the other doesn't work, right? And the same way, they'll start understanding more of that business domain, and that's the way I think the, the data scientists of the future will evolve. But for now, I think it's the combination of the people. So, um, so I guess, uh, Vishal, do we have time for one more question, or? Yeah. Was it time for drinks? Please. Hi, I, uh, there was a comment made earlier about uh, owning the data, generating the data, but I think that the important part is who <coughs> owns the data at the time of breach possible. All right, so everybody's familiar with the target scenario, but target really didn't do anything wrong. They're lying, the data was encrypted from the point of sale all the way into the database, but somebody hacked into their credit card slash machine. But they got the black eye. So it's who owns the data at the time of the breach, I think is going to be more important. But what I'm finding out in the industry is people, everybody's kicking the tires with this. They're moving data in, but they're moving in database data, warehouse data. And that tends to be structured. So they know that as data is being flown in or moved.
moved in, they know the third column is your social security number, the fifth is your email, the ninth is your credit card. And they know where that is, but I'm finding everybody is now holding back from moving in unstructured data because they don't know where any of the sensitive. Now, this only contains sensitive information, you know, HIPAA, PCI, PIF. What are you seeing on the industry that allow that to move on? They're getting held back by compliance, by their own IT security, going, whoa, 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 what are you moving in here? And they can't because the compliance laws are moving back. Now, I have a company, my company does this, but I'm seeing what one of the US. So, I guess the question is whether you see a reluctance in moving to unstructured data. Yeah. If I can. In our startup world, we don't see it at all, but we tend to have fewer companies that are dealing with HIPAA or PCI or other uh, such data. The uh, There are a, a layer of technologies that are being developed that are all about data, data governance and data provenance and being able to track even in a you know, a lar very large Hadoop cluster, you know, where to come from, where's it going, how's it being used, and so I think there are some technologies uh, that are, that are I would characterize today as being relatively nascent, relatively early, that, will, that are, are starting to address that issue, because uh, it, it is a, an important issue, and you'll see, um, you know, just as with the adoption of public cloud infrastructure, you know, heavily regulated industries are going to be a little bit laggards, perhaps, on, on some, of those, uh, some of those use cases. So I think, uh, given the time, I think we probably should uh, thank the panel. <laughs> and of course, thank uh, Vishal for organizing all of this.